these uh, tremendous things. So now, 1 Corinthians 15.10. Now we're in Acts. Go past Romans. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So who did the laboring through him? It was God, and it was the grace of God. And who is the grace of God? It is Jesus. So it is Jesus that was doing the laboring through the Apostle Paul. I want you to see this. He recognized, Paul really saw, that if he was to imitate Christ, as Christ Allah emptied himself of all his glory, so that now he couldn't live with that glory and with that power that he had formerly, He's emptied out now, so it is the Father now that fills him, and it is the Father that is doing the living through him. And the Apostle Paul vividly saw that, and he says, if I am to imitate Christ, then the only way that I am to live is then to allow Christ to live through me. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn with me to Galatians 2.20. You're in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then we go to Galatians 2, 20, and then 21. We love this scripture, Galatians 2, 20, and 21. It tells us here, Galatians chapter 2, and in verse 20. Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, when Christ was placed on the cross, I also was crucified with him. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, if you understand this verse, those who really understand would not do the living. They would allow Jesus to do the living through them. So he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this physical body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now just for your information, there's four eyes here in the verse 20. The first two eyes refer to the old man. The second two eyes refer to the new man. So let me read this once again. I, the old man, have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, the old man, who lives. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I, the new man, now live in the flesh, I, the new man, live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now look at verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. The King James says, I do not frust frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, if righteousness comes by doing the works of the law, then, he says, Christ died in vain. Now what does it all mean? I do not set aside the grace of God. Now what is the grace of God that he's talking about here? He's talking about Christ. He's talking about Christ. The grace of God was specifically, he's talking about Christ doing the living through us. Do you know that that is grace? Amen. When he is the one to do the living through us and that you are being set free, you're off the hook, you don't have to live this Christian life. Amen. Remember last week we learned that to the 
uh, unbeliever, the good news is that you don't have to die. But to the believer, the good news is that you don't have to live. Hallelujah. Because Christ is the one that's been called to do the living. That is the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, or if righteousness comes through doing the works of the law, then Christ died in vain, and in the in reference it says, Christ died for nothing. So, he came to live in us. Now the thing is, here's a big question. Besides God giving us eternal life and eternal salvation, why did Christ come to live in us for? He came to live in us so that he could live, what? Through us. You got that? Why did he come to live in you? So that he could live, what? Through you. I want you to understand, this is true righteousness. Because that's what it says here. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, in other words, if righteousness comes through you doing the living by you doing the works of the law, then Christ has died in vain. But you see, the grace of God is actually, and the righteousness of God, is it is Jesus living through us. Hallelujah. So if you want to really experience the righteousness of God, what is true righteousness and what is the grace of God? It is you allowing Christ in you to live through you. Hallelujah. Of course, many of you are going to ask the question, oh, how do I let Jesus live through me? Well, that's why you should go to GT meetings so you can discuss that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what is true righteousness? Christ doing the living through us is true righteousness. So, when I talk about us doing the living, if we're doing the living, then it is not true righteousness, it is unrighteousness, or it is self-righteousness. And this frustrates the grace of God and causes Christ to have, to have died in vain or for nothing. If you're doing the living, then you don't understand Galatians 2.20 and what being crucified with Christ is all about. Why did God crucify you? God's plan was not only to nail Christ to the cross, not only to nail our sins to the cross, but also to nail us to the cross. Amen. Us meaning our egos with the sinful nature of the old man. Now, it is not God's plan, listen to this now, it is not God's plan to improve us, Amen. but it's to remove us. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, it's not God's plan to improve you. Tell them that. Tell them it's His plan to remove you. Whether you know it or not, this gives you freedom. Because the problem is not really the other person. The problem is with you. When the old man gets out of the way and you allow the new man to live, you live that Christ nature lives through you, this is when the problem gets solved. When, we, when the new man is living, we don't have problems. You only have problems when the old man is living. But the old man, we have got to recognize and acknowledge he's already dead. So don't allow the flesh to live through you. Therefore, imitate me just as I imitate Christ means 
Just as Christ allowed the Father to live through him, and just as I, Paul, allowed Christ to live through me, even so, you also should let Christ live through you. You can live your life, or you can experience the life that God has prepared for you as Christ is allowed to live through you. Amen. That's the grace life. Amen. So many people are saved, but they're living their own life. Mm -hmm. They're living the good life, but they're not living the gospel life. Mm -hmm. They're not living the grace life. And you can be saved, and you can live the good life, the life that you're trying to make for yourself, and then you will die, and you will go to heaven, but you'll never experience the life that God had prepared for you as you would have allowed Jesus to live through you. What a waste. That he was the abundant life, and yet you chose to live your life. Because you wanted to do the living instead of you allowing Jesus to do the living through you. Now just think about how you got saved. Well, before I go through that, Scripture says, in Philippians 2.13, he says, It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So isn't that fantastic? Well, it is God that is actually working in us. In Jeremiah 31, in fact, let's turn there, there. Jeremiah 31, 31. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31. I'm turning to a lot of scriptures this morning because I want the scriptures to speak to your heart. Jeremiah 31, 31, down to verse 34. It says here, are you there, Jeremiah, after the book of Isaiah? Then Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, actually, because this is the Old Testament. It was talking about what was going to take place in the future. But we know now that we're living in the New Testament age. Behold, the days have already come. But it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant, not like the covenant that I made with them with Moses, with the law, with the Ten Commandments and all the other laws. He says, I'm not going to make a covenant like that. My covenant, which they what? They broke. He says, Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So I'm not going to make a covenant. I'm not going to make a, another covenant that they are going to be able to break. He's now going to make an unbreakable covenant. Because the first covenant was breakable. This new covenant is going to be unbreakable. He says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall each or every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Amen. Now, turn with me to Ezekiel 36. You're in Jeremiah. Just keep going. You'll come to Lamentations, then Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. Ezekiel chapter 36, looking at verse 26 to 27. This is still talking about 
the new covenant that he's going to make. Ezekiel 36, 26. God says, I will give you...